You know, I'm excited. I'm closing out our series on prayer. And I don't think that we have an issue in the fact of no one wants to pray. I think we run into the fact of not wanting to pray because we don't feel like God hears us or is answering our prayers the way we want it. I think that's what we run into. So today, I want to talk on positional prayer because I think we have to position ourselves in a particular way for God to hear us. Why do I say that? Because I'll get to it. Let me read the scripture and then you'll understand. So I'm going to be in 2 Chronicles 7 and I'm going to read 11 through 14. Then Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heaven so that there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, heal their land. If my people. Now I believe that a scripture is more powerful once you understand the context in which it was written. Because I think a lot of times we pull scriptures out. For instance, for I know the plans that I have for you. We love that. We quote it all the time. Problem is, most people don't hear the first part for I know. God is saying, I know the plans. We pray with our plan, trying to get God to line up. And he said, I know the plan. I know what's going on. You married folks know what this is like when when. When there's a plan for something, I don't like when plans change. Yes, it's awful. Throws me for a loop. I know. Be flexible. Well, then don't tell me this is what we're doing and then change it up on me. It's hard for me to be flexible. I'm not Gumby, okay? (laughs) So, yeah, I know. I should just be this humble, sweet wife that just goes, no problem. But I like to have a little bit of gumption inside of me. And, and so when plans change or when you get something in the mail that you have to put together, there's a plan for it and how it's supposed to be. And if you veer from that, you will get to the last part that you're putting together and realize you forgot one of the most important parts at the bottom of a kid's kitchen that was part of the base floor. And you spent two and a half hours and now you have to take it all apart again because you didn't follow the plan. So a lot of times we'll say scriptures based on what we want it to sound, say, or be like. And we pull it and we go, okay. So I I want us to break down the context of what's going on here. In 2 Chronicles, what has just taken place is we know David and Goliath, all that's passed. David became king. He made a stupid decision, asked for forgiveness. God forgave him, and he had a son. And David wanted to create this house for God, and God actually told him in the chapter before, I'm going to let Solomon build this. So here we are. Solomon has spent seven years building this temple for God, as you want to say, the first major church where his presence was going to be in there because that's what should happen in a church. His presence should be here. If it's ever not here, go somewhere else. His presence has got to be here for it to be what God wants, okay? You getting that? Okay, good. And they have spent $300 million building this. So everybody who likes to get upset when people spend money to build buildings, don't ever read the Bible and what God spent. Oh, I want gold on this wall, and I want this. Like, could you imagine if, if we even come close to anything that they used to spend back then? But it was an honoring thing. And then they spent seven days celebrating what had taken place. And this is right after the seventh day Solomon is going home. And he just began to thank God for what he's doing. And then God appeared to Solomon in the night and he said to him, I've heard your prayer and I have chosen this place. And then he goes through, when I shut up the heavens so there's no rain, I command the locusts to devour or I send pestilence among my people, if my people. The word if is used 1,595 times in the Bible. Why? Because there are things contingent on how we do it. If. If you do this. I'm horrible with directions. And Brian, I will say, how do I get here? Well, he goes, if you take Walton, and I'm like, that means nothing to me. Tell me what's around that. There's a Starbucks. Okay, thank you. Okay, next. 
Like, I'm that. Like, if you tell me, okay, I'm, I'm at the corner where the mall is over here, and that's me. Like, I don't know the street. I don't know their names. Okay? The street with no names? No. Okay. And so, um, and, I, and so he'll say, if you go this way, if I don't, I don't actually get where I'm trying to get to. If I don't do what he tells me to do. So, so understand right here, God's letting you know, if my people... Well, part of the scripture that really bothered me was verse 13, and I kind of wanted to take it out. I was sitting there studying, and I was thinking, can I take out the part where it's like, I'm going to do this and if this, because that just doesn't really go along with the God, the way that I like, the way that here, that, that sounds. And, and God said, you're, you're not understanding where that's coming from. And I said, explain to me. And he said, I'm referencing what happened to the children in Egypt before they got out. There was the locust came. And that word pestilence actually means plague. And what is he saying? He's saying this, our obedience to God doesn't stop opposition. You ever prayed for healing and get sicker? No one? Okay, cool. So I, that happened. You pray for your finances to be touched from God, and you have nine unexpected bills that come the next day? Because obedience to God is not going to stop opposition. Because guess who hears your prayers too? His name's Satan. So he hears when you start to believe for healing, and so symptoms get worse. He hears when you begin to go, I'm finally going to start tithing. I'm finally going to start giving God what belongs to his. And he goes, oh, are you? I'm going to have somebody remember this bill from like two years ago, and they forgot to get it from you. The moment you begin to step out in faith, opposition. Why? Because obedience doesn't stop opposition. Ask Jesus. He was obedient to the cross. That's some opposition. Hey, no, I want you to build an ark. Great, it's going to take 100 years and everybody's going to make fun of you and you really don't even know the thing that's coming that I'm telling you why you're building the boat for the stuff that's going to come from the sky that you haven't seen, but trust me, opposition. And yet we get frustrated the moment anything gets difficult. The moment opposition begins to come. So what God is saying here is, hey, remember when the children of, of Israel were, were sitting there and they wanted to be set free, but the locust came through and, so, and then the death angel, but what did I tell them? Put blood above your doors. A door above your doorpost so that you can be saved. Why? Because if my people who are called by my name, my people, he's calling you by name, will humble themselves, do what I've asked you to do. Usually that's part of humility. Do what I've asked you to do. And all of a sudden we begin to see what God could actually do. The problem is we go into prayer to inform God instead of involve God. God doesn't need any more information. You already called 10 of your friends to tell them what's happening. You already, it's your Facebook status. Everybody knows what's happening. It's on an Instagram story. You got a TikTok video for it. Like, you've got it all set up. Y'all don't know what TikTok is? Don't even worry about it. I haven't figured it out either, okay? So my age is showing now. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? Everybody knows. So instead of going into prayer to involve God, come and ride on my storm, come and be a part of this battle but I want you to win it, but you're still in it. We just give a bunch of information and then walk out and we feel like we haven't been heard. Because it's, it's not communication with God. It's not that one-on-one -on -one communication. So, so God is setting it up right here. He says if. So we all know everything he says after this, this is, this is part of, you know, if you've ever been anything, they'll say it's a contingency plan. If all this works out, then this and this and this will happen. So God's letting you know, I'll get to the part of the promise part, but it's all contingent on if. The Amplified Bible, I want to read out of there, says, if my people who are called by my name, which I love that because he's already saying you're mine. Our, our, our little girl, Jaylee, she's four. If we walk through Target, she will tell people that I'm her mommy, like they're wondering. That's my dad. That's my mom. What It's a part of her knowing who she is. It's a part of her understanding, I'm protected because that's my mom, you can't take me. Because she'll whisper and say, no strange ladies are going to get me, right? We saw Tangled, and so it's like, now it's this whole thing about strange ladies. I said, stop talking to me about strange ladies. She's like people who pretend to be people's mommies that aren't. So she makes sure everybody knows, I know this is my mommy. There is not another one. <laughs> And so it's that understanding why she, and so God is, God is already saying, hey, when you go, if my people who are called, I want you to go in understanding who you are. You belong to me. So understand you've already got, you're already ahead of the game. Humble themselves and pray and seek, crave 
require as a necessity my face. Man, I think so many of our prayers, because I, I have dealt, are us seeking God's hands. God, I need this to come through to me. God, I want this. I want this. If Brian came home every day from being at work or hunting and not bringing any deer home, um, sorry, I just had to throw that in. And uh, I love you to pieces. And uh, all I said, all I do is, where? No, a lot, of, a lot of times what I do is I grab his face because I've missed who he is. The necessity of, of I crave his presence, not what he can bring me. And God is saying, I need that same thing. I need that. I can feel the hunter in you. He sees him. He's waiting for the big one. So I don't want people to think you don't know how to shoot stuff. We're just not going to take anything under certain points, whatever that means, okay? So I get a speech about it. Oh, I saw this one. And I'm like, did you get it? No, I'm just waiting. Whatever. Okay. It's just, I don't know how you like it, but whatever. Okay. And so I'd be shooting everything. I mean, I'd be like, I got seven squirrels. I mean, you know, I don't need them, but I got them, you know, and that would just be bad. Sorry if you love animals. I apologize. I'm not saying any of this. Okay. So they're God's creatures. Okay. So, um, or maybe you're praying and that's why he's not getting anything. I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. Okay. So stop it. (laughs) Okay. I just need him to get the big one. All right. So, um, so we're sitting here, and it's like that scripture when we're craving, we're craving God's face because I'm not in here to inform you. God, I'm not coming to you because I need you to actually even do something. I'm here because I'm just seeking your face. And then the Bible goes and says, turn from their wicked ways. Turn from your wicked ways. Okay, I'm going to have you come up here, Courtney. Turn from your wicked ways. And we're going to break this down. This is where I'm going to spend a lot of my time because I think we hear this. And this should be a simple illustration. You're God, so stand over there. Don't get a big head about it. All right, so if I'm coming to talk to God or anybody, let's just say right now you're Courtney. How's your day been? That's awkward. She's going to be like, why why do you got your back to me? I don't know. Today I just don't feel like seeking your face. You know, right now I just want to know, did you get that Starbucks drinks I asked you for? That's the majority part of our friendship is coffee. So, yeah, were you able to grab that? You weren't. Okay, awesome. Um, So is there anything you need? There's no seeking the face. The Bible says that we have to turn. The Bible said because what, what I need, he has. But I can't get it if I'm turned in the wrong direction. So the Bible says that I have to turn from my wicked ways to receive what God has for me. So here's the biggest problem. Is the word wicked ways trumps the majority of us very good, very saved Christians. I turned from my wicked ways once I was saved. Well, let me tell you something. When I dug deep into understanding, because I kind of realized that I always skipped over that part. Okay, I'll see your face. I already let go of my wicked ways. Okay, and turn from that. When I actually looked up that word in the Hebrew, it means evil course. It's also the same Hebrew word used in Genesis to describe the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what that's telling me is we go back to Adam and Eve. Eve could have and Adam could have eaten from any daggum tree they wanted to, but they had to have that one because, you know, you know, I don't know if you have kids. It's like, oh, hey, I have all these pencils for you. Oh, not this one because it doesn't work. Well, that was the one I wanted. Well, I mean, it's not even sharpened. I don't know. For some reason, the very thing you tell somebody they can't have, that's what they want. And so when I, when I break that down and I begin to realize that, the, that that same word for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is used to describe in Second Chronicles when God says, turn from your wicked ways, what I hear God saying is, turn from the course that you think is right and turn my way. You've got to turn from the evil, not that you're doing evil. No, you're turning from the way Satan is saying, this is good. This will prosper you. This will bring you what you need. You're turning from that and saying, God, I'm going to go your way. But the moment we hear, turn from your wicked ways, you think, oh, I did that when I got saved. Because that's what I thought. Maybe you're more spiritual and you dug deep and you knew what the Hebrew word was. For me, I didn't. So I realized all of a sudden how many times have I come to God in these moments of prayer and crying out, but I'm praying and I'm turned towards my course and not his so I can't hear it. I'm I'm turned towards my plan and how it should work out. 
My plan was not to take five years to get pregnant with one child. The Duggars had like 15 during the time. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like, I remember counting, and I was like, gee, I mean, hello. I mean, it was just a part of me was like, God, I did not sign up for this. And maybe you're more spiritual than me, and if you are, awesome. But, I mean, there were moments of frustration. There were moments, and why it was so hard for me to pray, I realize now, because I was turned toward an expectation and a thought and a plan that I had written out myself. That I'll get married by this age, then I'll have kids. Well, that was already shot, because I thought I'd be married by 21. I was 29 till he found me. It took him forever. You know, and it's like the deer. Everything just takes longer, okay? And uh, I'm choking. I, t- I love you so much. And, and I mean, and then I was like, I'll have kids by then. And I remind God all the time, like, I get that, that age in heaven is not a thing, but it is here. Like, I'm 41. That's, that's you know, you're, you're, you were tipping an iceberg, you know? I mean, because when, you're, when your doctor goes, well, I mean, that's not a good sign. Now, I'm not going back to her. But I'm just saying when she kind of gives you, no, it, it was just not, no. I was just mad. I was like, no, no, you should just be encouraging, okay? I didn't ask you to perform a miracle. God's going to perform the miracle. I was just saying, you know, hey, and she's like, oh, we might need to activate some things. I don't know what that means. You're not going to put something in me and activate things. That's just for me. I was just like, no, I'll let God activate it, whatever that is. So, but I told God, I, you know, here time is of the essence, apparently. I think it is. I don't really, I mean, I told him I didn't really want to be Sarah in the Bible. It was like, at 90. It was like, you know, I mean, sure, it could be such an incredible testimony here in northwest Arkansas, but I don't really want to be used in that way, okay? I mean, like, <laughs> that's just be weird. And uh, so I've been in those moments where I'm frustrated and I have this own plan and God just keeps reminding me it's not about what I think. That's why it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek Crave my face with the necessity. Turn from their course. Then I can forgive. Because we hear the word sin and we think, well, I didn't rob a bank the other day. We always hear sin and we think it's major. Sin can be a wrong thought. Sin can be gossip. Hello. Sin can be doing the thing you know You shouldn't do in doing it. And when we hear sin separates us from the love of God, so many people picture God turning from them because they're sinning. And really what's happening is your sin is pushing God away. God is not going away. God says, I'm I'm trying to be attentive to you. I want to hear you, but your sin pushes me. Because that's sin's job is to push God as far away from us as possible. Your position is has to change in order for your prayer to be heard. Your position has to change. In order for Courtney to hear me better and not to feel like I was a weird friend, I would have needed to turn to her face. In order for God to know that we're seeking him, we have to turn to his face. Your position has to change. That's why I called it positional prayer. We go in to pray, and yet God never gets the opportunity to speak. Here's what I need. Here's what I want. High five. Get your angels on it. We're good to go. And we throw in some scriptures that we know on top of this, and yet God told you it's only if you do this. Only if you humble yourself. If you turn from your own ideas. Are goals wrong? No. But God's got to be able to change them. I'm a goal-oriented person. But in this day and age, being pastors, goal-oriented would tell us at conferences and places we've been, you've got to try to be the fastest growing church in northwest Arkansas. No, I want the healthiest group of people in northwest Arkansas that know how to seek the face of God, that know how to pray when all hell breaks loose, that understand that he's a miracle-working God. Not that I can say, oh, we reached this. No, they got here. It's about their story and where they're going. It's about them and how they're growing and the healthiness of a church, the healthiness 
of the foundation because God's plan is to have the foundation set right. So sometimes those goals can get us off. If we were to go off what the world standard would say means you're successful at what you do. I look at success this week. I found a letter that one of our our youth kids wrote us, and it was years ago. It was right when I was pregnant with Jaylee, and what was written in that letter, not only did I need when it was given to me, I needed it that day, but to be able to send it to that person because they're still with us, that to me is success. When they're still passionately loving and serving in the house of God, and it wasn't a fad for them, that to me is successful. And the only way we obtain this thing that we like to call purpose is by understanding how to pray. You have to know how to pray. You will never hear your purpose outside of prayer. Prayer is more for me than it is for anybody else. In moments where I feel like if if something's not shifting and changing or I'm worried, when I get in prayer, it's almost impossible for me not to have a better outlook. I can't truly go into real prayer and not come out changed. I cannot come out of being saturated in the presence of God and not actually have something shifted inside of me. That's why the enemy does everything he, to, he can to keep you out of prayer. Because he knows prayer changes you. We're not changing God. We're not trying to convince God and form God. We, we are engaging heaven with what is happening here on earth so that something can take place. That's why he says, listen, Solomon, if my people, if you get this, if my people will will humble themselves, man, if they'll seek my face, turn from the way they think they should go, I'm going to forgive them and I'm going to heal their land. And this is my favorite, verse 15. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. Now, what is God saying? You built this whole thing for seven years. You spent $300 million. This place is amazing. But it won't be till that that I can hear you, that I will open my eyes to what is being prayed in this place till that happens. You can build the most amazing thing. You can have the best prayer closet in northwest Arkansas. I remember one day when I got super pumped about this. I think I was 14 years old. I pulled all my clothes out of the closet. I said, no, it's a prayer closet. It's not even. I I put myself in drawers. I posted up pictures. You know how many times I actually went in there? Why? Because I got excited about it. But then I started getting busy, and I started getting distracted. The enemy will do whatever he can. Set a time to pray with your spouse, married couples. Your children will have the most difficult time ever falling asleep on those nights you want to pray. I mean, I'm telling you, it, it was like the spawn of Satan comes out. And you're like, what has happened? I mean, our child manifested the other night. I literally was like, what, like, like we've had an easy, you know, go to bed, we hug you good night. It was like, ah, 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 ah. I was like, what is happening? Like, you got to kiss me one more time. I'm like, whoa. When you get to a place where you're like, hey, this is what we're doing, everything, everything starts to happen. Because the enemy is terrified of you doing, because he knows, God said, if, then my eyes will be open and my ears are attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. I'm going to say, I'm gonna, this is my last point, but I'm going to spend some time here, and then I'm going to close. If God's not done working, then you shouldn't be done waiting. How do I know God's working? Okay, I'm so glad you asked. Philippians 2.13, because God is always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey his own purpose. He's saying it again, for I know the plans that I have for you. You don't know them, joker. Stop trying to pray it your way. I know them. And I'm going to do everything I can to make you willing and able to obey his own purpose. We quote scriptures, oh, God, only open the doors and only you can open and slam the doors. But there there are doors we wish would open and we pray for them to open. And if they shut, we actually get mad and don't go, oh, maybe God didn't want that. We're like, oh, man, I thought for sure I had that one right. And God's like, but you don't understand. I'm always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey his own purpose. God's purpose will always prevent the enemy's plan. I mean, ask Eve. So so Eve makes a wrong decision, goes her own course. But one of the first things that God spoke to them was be fruitful and multiply. She still fulfilled her purpose. 
we're here today because she was fruitful, multiplied. David, unbelievable king, slays Goliath, becomes this awesome person, falls into sin and sleeps with a woman that's not his wife. And yet, because he humbled himself and prayed. See, I think Solomon understood what this kind of prayer looked like because I think he knew the story about what his dad had to do. His dad had to humble himself, seek God's face. And God said, you are a man after my own heart. See, this isn't about how do I keep my sin level down and my, and my worship level up and all this kind. Of, no, it all goes based on if God is still working, then you should be willing to wait. You should be willing to stay in that place and that posture of expectancy. That posture of knowing he's able and he's willing and he will. But for us, it's so hard because we are so confined by time. You know, it's funny, and all the years of talking to different people that have struggled to have children, it's funny because there, every month there's a reason why you think God should do it. That month you can remember some friend you knew that fell off of the, you know, the, the slide and was miraculously healed in the month of March, so maybe that's when you'll find out. Or, or your, there's all, I'm telling you, you will pick up anything out of your brain sometimes to convince yourself of certain things. But what I have finally convinced myself of the fact is as long as he's working, I'm willing to wait. And the only way that I know that he's working is to be in his presence. Because when I'm in his presence, he speaks things that make my heart know that he's working. He's moving. He's doing. It doesn't always happen when I think it should and how, how I think it should. But he's doing it. And when I go into the prayer closet, and I go into prayer, and I go in with the expectancy of knowing who Jesus is, knowing that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, knowing he's the God that split the Red Seas, knowing he's the God that said, stretch forth your withered hand, Knowing he's the God that said, pick up your mat and walk. Knowing he's the God that put mud in a blind man's eyes and the man saw. Knowing that he is a God that can do far more than I could ever dream, think, or imagine. Knowing that he's a God that's above it all. Knowing that he is healer to those things that have been told are uncurable. Knowing that he makes the impossible things possible. Knowing that cancer cannot stand to that name. Knowing that he is above it all. He is the same God that split the sea. He is the same God that will stop for you and split wide open whatever you need. But you have to believe it. See, when I go in prayer, something happens to me that I start to see that God when I'm in prayer. I start to remember the faithfulness of who he is. That he still hasn't let me down. Why? Because in prayer, I'll start to remember the time when I used to think it would never happen. It's in those moments in prayer when I remember when he said, I'm going to use this for my glory, and he did. And when I'm in prayer and I know that his faithfulness, and that he endures forever. But I have to let go of my own way this thing should look. Got to let go of my bullet points, A, B, 1, 2, and how it should fall. Because I promise you, kingdom, it will be totally upside down. What you think should have happened first will probably happen last. And the thing that you thought would have happened last will happen first. Because there's things that God is lining up we're not aware of. Because he's always working. And I think he's so understanding of the fact that even in our frustrations, even in our our anger, he still listens. And he thinks if they just only knew what I was doing, and if they only knew what I was setting up for them. You ever been around a friend or a spouse and you know there's a surprise birthday party for them, but they think no one's doing anything because that's the day that everybody should be telling them happy birthday and because you're planning a party, no one says anything. So then it makes it even worse. So they're like depressed and thinking, no one even cares about me. I think that's sometimes how it is. God's planning this unbelievable <laughs> setup for a miracle. And we're getting ready to walk through the doors and see it. But for some reason, it feels like the most lonely, 
scared. I don't know if he hears place we've ever been. And yet he's just sitting there going, man, you have no idea how long I've been. I've got balloons set up. I'm about to celebrate you like you've never been celebrated. You're about to watch a miracle that only you get to see because you went through the fire. Church, we've got to be willing to give God a chance to show off. The only way he gets to show his glory on this earth is if we actually walk through stuff. When we walk through trials and tribulations, he gets to show off and show that he's more powerful than Satan. He's more powerful than it all. But unless those opportunities are there, he can't show off. So understand, we're just part of this story to bring people to Jesus. And prayer is what he gave us. So in the moments where we feel so alone, the moments where we feel, is it still going to happen? So we'll get on our knees and he shows up. And when we seek his face, I believe he touches ours. And he says, daughter or son, I've got you. I'm working everything out for your purpose, the thing I've called you for, the thing that you question if you can do. No, I've got you. The thing that you keep going back and thinking of the words that have been spoken over your life. No, no, those don't mean anything. What I say matters.